Welcome. Welcome to my journey as an LDS scholar. Uh, my name is Alan Wilkins from the Faculty Center. Uh, Jane Birch, my colleague from the Faculty Center, and I for some time have been studying how faculty members can be both spiritually strengthening and intellectually enlarging. And we've talked with faculty, surveyed them, uh, had them in focus groups uh, across campus, uh, interviewed and, fo and done focus groups with their students and have been learning some wonderful things about what just a marvelous faculty uh, here at BYU is uh, doing. What we, were, what we kept wondering is how did they get this way? Uh, how did they develop into these wonderful people, these wonderful LDS teacher scholars? And uh, this series is the way we're trying to invite a variety of uh, one, these wonderful faculty members from across the campus to share their story, their journey, the rest of the story, as it were. Um, and we're just so delighted to have uh, Dr. Susan Easton Black uh, here to share her story, a remarkable story, and I'm looking forward to it. I've asked Randy Bott if he would offer an opening prayer, and come on, it'll take you a minute to get here, Randy. And then after he's offered a prayer, I'll, I'll just provide a brief introduction for Dr. Black, and then we'll uh, have the opportunity to hear from her. So. Our kind Heavenly Father, <clears throat> what a wonderful opportunity to meet here as friends and colleagues and students and admirers of our sister, Susan Easton Black. We love her and we love the example that she set. We love the influence that she's had worldwide and pray that thou wilt bless her with the confidence and the ability to speak and to share with us some of the insight of what has made her <clears throat> such a, an example for anyone who would like to embark on the road of scholarship while maintaining their spirituality. We're grateful for this opportunity to participate in this type of a forum and pray that it will continue and that people will be able to see that you can be a scholar and, and still maintain your spirituality as you sequence through the challenges of living in the latter days. We now pray for thy spirit to be with us that we might be able to listen and be edified and understand and do so in the sacred and holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Dr. Susan Easton Black joined the faculty in 1978. She is a past Eliza R. Snow Fellow, Associate Dean of General Education and Honors, and Director of Church History and the, in the Religious Studies Center. She was the recipient of the Carl G. Mazur Distinguished Faculty Lecturer Award in 2000, which is the highest award given a professor on the BYU campus. She has authored, edited, and compiled over 90 books and as many articles. Dr. Black, Susan, is a favorite of the students. Uh, she loves students and they return the favor. They pack her classes and struggle to take notes fast enough to keep up with her inspiring lectures given without notes and seemingly without taking a breath. She's the wife of the late Harvey Black and a wonderful colleague and a mentor to, to ment many. Uh, pleasure to have you come and do this for us, Susan. Uh, you'll note that we're recording this. Uh, we've invited Susan to take 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, that's less than the 50 that you're usually geared to. I hope this works. but and then to allow you some question and answer, and I'll use this mic uh, to, so that we can pick it up. We've asked her permission to record this and to share this uh, for faculty development and other purposes uh, to help uh, share this even further. So thank you so much. We'll turn the time to you. self-disclosing and I usually don't do such a thing in my classes. I've always thought I have someone better to talk about and so it's actually a little bit stressful to take a few moments to say something about me. 
So thank you for your willingness as I'm now semi-self-indulgent. You can tell as a kid I was pretty cute. <laughs> okay. I was so cute, in fact, as I grew up in Long Beach, California, we had uh, then always the Miss Universe pageant. Every year would come to Long Beach. And you get these floats of these beautiful women wearing bathing suits going down Ocean Boulevard. And I'd always go with my father, and every year he would say to me, one day, Susan, you're going to be Miss Universe. <laughs> well, as I started growing up, he started saying, as we would continue to go to these parades, one day you'll be Miss California. <laughs> <laughs> it was only when he started to say, one day you'll be Miss Welcome to Long Beach, that I began to realize I probably need to figure out what I want to be. Now, I had assumed that I would have the life of my mother, meaning I would live the American dream. Uh, Norman Rockwell, man goes to work, woman's in the home, I raise all kinds of wonderful children. And uh, so that, uh, I don't know, there are plans in life, but if it's a perfect life, then it's hardly worth talking about unless it's a savior, right? So what happened to me, I had no plans that I would have a career. So I could say that even through college. But looking back on my life now, uh, 40 years in the classroom, I tried to think what classes really made a significant difference for me that uh, really benefited my life. I'd say the first class has everything to do with the typewriter. When I was in seventh grade, I took a typing class and I'd been playing the piano for years and it seemed like I could make that bell ring before anybody else had just typed a few words. And um, that talent is something that I have used now almost every single day of my life. The other class that had a huge impact was also in seventh grade. In seventh grade, I was picked out of a junior high, and there were three of us picked out. Uh, I was picked out because I did fairly well in school, and then there was a person that did medium well. And then there was a person that you'd say, this kid is going to drop out, you know, if it weren't for mom and dad, you know, getting him to school every day. So what they did is for that for an hour, every, every day during the school period, I would go to where there was a microfilm and a microfilm reader. So they would have three of them set up. And what would happen was they would put a statement on the reader, and then they would turn it off. It was like looking at a strobe light all the time. They would turn it off, and then you would, they would turn something back on and say, take a test on what you have just read. So for me, I got to be so good at this, they would put books during the hour. And I would see a page, and they taught me how to look in the middle of the page to see the whole page. And they go, boom, 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 and then take a test. And uh, it got to be, I, I felt like I was a freak show. <laughs> Pretty soon the principal is coming in to watch me. And before you know it, he's bringing in the, uh, you know, the school board and the superintendent. And they're saying, okay, Susan, do it for him. And I'm like, really? Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. okay. I, uh, I had actually thought that the reason that I could memorize so quick and I haven't used notes, I guess, almost my whole teaching career. And you'd say, can you do page number and this and that? And i go, oh, yeah. And I had assumed that it was because of this course. But in actuality, I have a son named John. He's here. OK, John, raise your hand. <laughs> OK. Uh, you know, my John got it. And uh, suddenly I realized he, he's an attorney in town. If you're choosing somebody else, you're making a bad choice. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he has the same thing. And uh, it literally took me until he was about in, I guess, junior high to not give so much credit to the microfilm reader. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so for me, I started out as a kindergarten teacher. And I've had people say to me, you know, you still have a ditzy demeanor. <laughs> it's, 
it's obvious to us that you taught kindergarten, and I bet you were good. And I'd say there were some things about kindergarten teaching that was good. What I found that was not good for me was uh, mixing paints, and uh, <laughs> then it was like an everyday thing, uh, putting the blocks back together, saying to all the little kids, come on the rug, and here would be one going off, and I just wasn't that good with discipline. And uh, adding to it, one day, I'm telling this amazing story about George Washington, and a little girl is licking my nylon. And suddenly I go, I think maybe I should continue with school and keep going. <laughs> <laughs> the next thing I taught was Utah history. Uh, I love those seventh graders. I, I actually think that's got to be one of my favorite ages. And uh, they were peppy and fun, and I let them pass notes as long as they could do it in Indian language, and uh, they could pass it in uh, the Deseret Alphabet. And you'd say I was pretty good, but the problem was I grew up in California. <laughs> so, you know, and I would say I was about a, a day ahead of the students, so I always hoped they would never ask me something. <laughs> I then became a geography teacher. I would say as a geography teacher, I'm now in ninth grade uh, teaching, and as a geography teacher, I fear that I became the eight millimeter film teacher. Because, uh, you know, uh, well, those kids, boy, did they like the films from Africa. <laughs> I could just show them over and over, and those were the favorites. But uh, actually, there were some really kind of larger young men in my class, and I also uh, struggled out. I was actually fearful of them. And uh, it was the same kind of discipline thing. So then I go, all right, now what? And um, I, I'm now still going to school and concluding, yep, you're right, I'm, I'm still working. And I moved into a neighborhood, and it was now I'm back in California. And in this neighborhood, we organized one of the first conscious raising groups. And how it was organized, this little kindergartner came home from kindergarten, and they had been told, draw a line that connects the, uh, the worker with the tool. And so you'd say, for the policeman, it was the police car. And for the fireman, it was the fire truck. And for the carpenter, it's supposed to be the hammer. And for the woman, it was supposed to be the shopping cart. And so this little kindergartner in my neighborhood connected the woman with the hammer because her mother was helping to build the house. And suddenly, my little neighborhood got up in arms and was actually going to sue the school board. And suddenly, I go, you know, what? None of that is right. Women should not be treated like that. And I became a professor of psychology of women. And, um, you know, I, I could just go to it. I didn't like that we didn't have equal pay. I didn't like that a woman couldn't be a CEO. But I also began to realize I was getting an edge. And I had a hard time losing it. <laughs> okay. And uh, the edge was now uh, pretty alive and well. So then I go, no, you know what I'm going to do? I hate driving my red pencil station wagon. You know what I'm going to become? I'm going to be a professor of money. And uh, I eventually became pretty good. I taught financial portfolio analysis. And I would say to people, why are you living on the west side when you could live on the east side? And uh, you'd say I, I was actually pretty good with the money and learning how to do it. But then I realized you know what, I don't actually believe everything I've just said. I know that money can give people a smile, but I'm telling you, money isn't where there's a big happiness. And I just barely live on the east side of campus, and I love the friends I have in my neighborhood. And suddenly I go, that just can't be me. Well, you realize the Lord now needs to interfere in my life. <laughs> because... Uh, if you can read everything and memorize everything, you can pretty much teach anything, right? <laughs> so the question is, what am I supposed to do? And through all of this, I never viewed that I had a career. 
it was just uh, kind of means to the end. In other words, I'm, I'm going to work all right, but my heart isn't there. I'm just putting in my time. And then I had an experience. And you know, to every, every life, there's got to be someone, something that comes around where you'd say, they open a door. And typically you'd say, well, it's got to be family. You know, it's got to be your best friends. <coughs> but what I found was, uh, it was the strangers. And uh, I put the three most influential people that helped me figure out my career. The first man over here is a man named Ellis Rasmussen. By this point, I'm interested in uh, genealogy. Can you tell I could be an honor student? <laughs> oh, okay. You know, I don't have much direction. I just, now I like this, now I like that. I read it and I, I got it. And so one, one summer, back in 1975, I came to one of those genealogy workshops that's put on by Continuing Ed. While I was at the workshop, I decided to take an hour off and go to the old Joseph Smith building. And I wanted to see my favorite professor on campus, who was named Milton Backman, because I had found some very exciting things in church history. Well, he wasn't there, and I'm passing by an office, and here's this man, Ellis Rasmussen. And uh, he said, well, why don't you come in and talk to me? And he goes, I haven't talked to one person that's, you know, it's before school starts, kind of the in-between, and I'm talking to him. And he goes, well, tell me about yourself. And he goes, you know, he kind of pauses. He goes, have you ever taught seminary? And I go, oh, no. In fact, I didn't even go. And uh, he said, well, you know, what about young women? And I go, I never graduated from that. Oh, my gosh, it was boring. And then he goes, well, uh, you know, what about have you ever taught an institute? And I go, oh, no, I've never do that. I'm not going to do that. And suddenly he put his head down. I, I go, I wonder if he's falling asleep. And uh, pretty soon he puts up his head and he goes, uh, I'm a patriarch. And he goes, you're supposed to be here and you're supposed to be teaching religion. Well, that was the biggest shock. I just laughed. I go, oh, it's so nice to meet you. And, you know, <laughs> and off I went. And I'm telling these friends at this genealogy conference, I had an experience that, you know, well, it will probably stay with me, but it was the oddest thing. I mean, you know, do I look like I teach religion? You'll quickly notice the one of the child uh, had me with uh, off-the-shoulder shirt. Okay. So, okay. The next thing that happened is uh, I get a letter from Jeffrey Holland. He's the dean of religion saying, uh, you, you want to come and, and teach here? And I wrote back, absolutely not. <laughs> okay. You know, there is no plan. You know, by this point, you know, I'm pretty entrenched in California and I'm going nowhere. Well, you ever had a year you wish you hadn't had? <laughs> okay. And uh, pretty soon, I, I now agree to come. And uh, George Grant, one of my uh, great friends, okay, was coming to BYU now at the same time I'm coming. Where are you, George? Okay, good. Okay, so uh, George, he can remember that uh, as I'm coming, Jeff Holland's meeting with the faculty. He's then rushing over to the Provo Temple. It's closed. And uh, he's banging on the door saying, let me in. I know I'm right. I know we need a woman. And uh, they're saying, no, only priesthood can teach religion. OK, the next person who has a huge impact on me is uh, Elder Dallin Oaks. So Elder Dallin Oaks, it's the time of the ERA movement. <laughs> I realize I could live and breathe that. <laughs> and uh, so ERA movement, he's now looking through the colleges on campus to make sure that each college has a woman. And uh, for a for, it had been 107 years uh, religion, and I'm now hired elsewhere. And uh, so uh, it had been 107 years uh, religion, and there had never been a female teacher. And so uh, he then began to look through our colleges on campus to see, well, who, who could be available, and who's been writing in the field. Well, I've been writing a lot of fields, but OK. So he now offers me a chance to move from an academic setting to religion. My knee-jerk reaction again was absolutely not. I knew that I would become a fireside queen, and I have a right. <laughs> I knew that uh, I would give more happy birthday 
Relief Society celebrations than I ever would professional papers. So I, I'm going to do an example. I had a son. I have a son that's a professor at Kansas State. And he called me up and he goes, hey, Mom, have you ever spoken in Washington, D.C.? And I go, oh, sure, Tuck. I've spoken there. I've done why I believe at the visitor center. I've uh, spoken at a couple of zone conferences, mission conferences. I've done know your religion out there. And he says, well, it looks to me like, Mom, I'm going to have a chance to speak at the Pentagon. And I go, oh, Todd, you're living my dream. Can you see this? So it was not an easy decision for me to make uh, to go to religion. In fact, I'm now saying to Elder Oaks, hey, I just can't see it. And yeah, I go, only if the prophet. I mean, no, he, he would have to come face to face, just tell me this was my move, would I be willing? And he said, well, I'm, I'm going to take it up to the Board of Trustees. And uh, if they say yes, will you transfer? And I go, ha! If you're telling me Spencer W. Kimball's going to say yes, I go, I would teach religion and I'll never look back. Well, okay. The end happened. <laughs> <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> okay. I've uh, now been in religion for over 30 years. Uh, most of the meetings I begin, begin, or most of the meetings I attend, begin, welcome brethren. I wear pink, I wear red, I wear blue, I wear green, and it is still Welcome Brethren. This is a small number of faculty. We now have over 70. Okay, you see that? So the question is, how am I going to feel in this group? Some were extremely nice, some were not. I'm going to feature Larry Porter. Larry Porter, I still write with the man. And you'd say, well, why would you do that? He's older. He's out of here. And I'd say, I could never walk into a faculty meeting without him standing up and recognizing that I was there. And you'd say, oh, that's old-fashioned. I mean, you know, yeah, you know, all women should walk in and should just be a part. And I'm saying, I will be forever grateful. And he'd say, well, you know, it's a little bit out of sync now. But the fact, he knew they were going to say, welcome, brethren. And at the same time, he wanted me to know that I was welcome. Okay. So, oops. Okay. <laughs> you realize, and I've, I've got to figure out who I'm going to be. Because now I'm, I'm doing something <coughs> that I had never dreamed as a child. I can now look at my patriarchal blessing, and now it kind of, you know, you wonder where they put that in. But uh, now I realize so much was, you'll know the details of the gospel. <laughs> I have no idea. You know, I was always interested in, come on, let's get to the good part. <laughs> so I have, a, I, I have a motto, and maybe it's because my, uh, my father was a businessman. He used to get so upset when his truck drivers, he'd find them just parked in the alley and not doing their work. And, uh, you know, I grew up with uh, such a businessman that, you know, every day, you know, it was, uh, you know, when I'd head off to work as a kid, he'd say, Stays work, on stays pay. Don't you dare short them. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of felt like I must do that. And to do that, I felt like uh, this was a rare opportunity. And no matter how I felt treated, I needed to give it my uh, heart, my mind, and strength. And, uh, you know, anybody that gives less in the workplace, how could you possibly be happy? In other words, uh, you give it an honest day's work, honest day's pay, this is the best I can do. And you put your whole passion into it, and you got to hope that it all works out. Well, for me, oh, the love of my, you know, love of my life, students. Um, my favorite students, obviously, my family. Oh, my family gets A's. <laughs> you know, they, they have to listen to me at home, so they might as well listen to me in class. <laughs> And uh, it's a guarantee. They were by far my favorite students. But uh, I have now taught, oh, I don't know, I'm at least 40,000 students on this campus. Uh, this, uh, this semester I have between seven and 800 students. Okay. I think they're just terrific. You know what I think about these students? You know, um, you know the, the class isn't about me, it's about them. And, um, you know, they're, they're gonna, they, they come, they dress in Levi's t-shirts and you know, but, but they're, they're going to be, become something great. And I just feel it's such a privilege 
that I get to bump my life into theirs. And uh, I, I can't tell you the joy I have when uh, someone would come up that's middle-aged and I'm now actually getting grandmothers. <laughs> you know, say, you are my teacher. I'm like, what? You're the goal. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and they say, you know, I remember you were my favorite. I'm like, oh, thank you. It was so worth it. Okay. I uh, couldn't do what I do without my research assistants. That has been joy of joys. They have been my best friends, and whether it's been a semester, whatever it's been, we've uh, traveled everywhere. Okay, and uh, actually, it's been pretty fun. This is the summer um, here. Uh, we're down in the Susquehanna region. Uh, over here, we're up uh, getting close to the sacred grove. Okay, uh, to keep myself young at heart, and uh, you realize we. We all get older, and uh, I, I never wanted the students to be an interference. And so, uh, to keep myself young at heart, whenever the bishop would say, hey, I'm thinking of a new calling for you, I'd always say, oh, good, I, I'd love to be with you, thank you. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, uh, you know, I've uh, lived in the same ward, and over 20 years served in young women. What, what a blessing that's been, because I then can find out you know, if I can relate to them, I can walk a few blocks over here and relate to the students. Okay, I also love my subject. Um, I, you know, you'd say, well, wait a minute, could I walk in and teach your math class? Uh, Jim Cannon, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> you know, I, I better I could teach an English class, I can maybe teach a science if I'm reading it all right, you know, going fast, but, oh, I, I can't imagine anything better and what I've got to teach. Uh, I know that Jesus is the Christ. I've walked where, you know, where he lived. I've written and written. I, I know Joseph was a great prophet. Well, okay, how do I show that I love, I love what I've, uh, my subject? And uh, you realize it would be bragging if it were not true. <laughs> okay. And so I'm just going to do it just straight as fast. Okay, I've written for LDS audiences. And uh, you'd say, yeah, wherever all these books are sold, can you buy my works? Uh, I don't know, they usually have about a six-week slideshow. <laughs> so, you know, pro probably not, not often. I've written with, uh, with artists, and that's been pretty fun. I even wrote the official Olympic book for 2002. <laughs> okay. uh, I've written a lot of scholarly works. So how many books have I written today? You know, I had my secretary yesterday, I go, Hey, let's just go through and count. You know, I, I think I'm over 90. And she goes, well, you know, you're actually at 134. <laughs> so uh, I can actually say without a sense of bragging that there isn't anybody in the church that has had more books than print. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'd say, so do you love your subject? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, okay. So what about academic articles? Well, you know. It's pretty hard to write academic articles if you're an LDS scholar. Your, your venues are small. But I said, okay, let's go through and just count, count the number of articles. I've now written 304. Okay, uh, because of that, because of love of students, because of love of subject, I actually received the Carl G. Mazur Distinguished Faculty Lecture. And uh, you'd say, uh, who helped put my name forward? Randy Bott, where are you? <laughs> okay. You know, without Randy, I'm sure it wouldn't happen. You'll see, there's me, and I'm smiling. Who's the woman to the side? She was a woman that when I went back to school, she helped watch my children. She was my visiting teacher. And my conclusion was, I, I can't get this award alone. I have some people that made that happen in my life. And uh, I never wanted to forget Janice. You know, you realize we all stand on the shoulders of someone that's great that's gone before us. And in my life, she was great. She made a huge difference. But you see the three handsome men in spite of them all? Okay. Uh, that's my son, Brian, and then Todd, and John. Uh, Brian and John are uh, attorneys. John here in town. Todd's a professor. And uh, what you're going to learn is you can't educate a mother without educating the family, right? And so by this, uh, this busy teacher watching my family, I wanted all these people to know that without them, the award would not be possible. 
the result is I now have a picture at the Harold B. Lee Library. It's not quite Miss Universe. <laughs> but uh, when you look down there, you'll be able to, they started giving these awards in 1964, and one professor a year gets it. We've had two others from religion receive the award. One was uh, Hugh Nibley in 1965, and the other was Wilfred Griggs in 1995. Okay, what do I feel about BYU? I think it's very important to give back. Uh, how come this is so significant to me? I got a scholarship to come to BYU for poverty. And uh, you know, <laughs> who knows what I would have been. <laughs> I think I could have been actually still a good kindergarten teacher. I don't think I would have the patience anymore, but you know, uh, I don't know. <laughs> it, uh, so as a result, you give back and uh, blesses your life again and again. I am absolutely thrilled uh, and uh, feel very, very grateful to BYU for what they've done for me and for my family. Okay, okay so I have gratitude, but my gratitude can be offensive. Okay, so uh, now I'm about to offend some people. When it, one thing I'm very grateful for is I still love my students. I actually know some professors who are my age that the students are an interference. They would rather stay in their office than make the class. And uh, I can honestly tell you, I, I love my students. I look forward to each time I get to teach. Second thing, I still love my subject. I actually bought a house in Nauvoo. Was it a good financial choice? Absolutely not. But you know, you cannot think about the subject and not wanting to be a part of the rock. I just, I want to be part of the fabric. I still honestly believe I do an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. I'm not always on campus, but I write a lot at home. And I think just the sheer number of books would, would say to you, sure, all these years, 40 hours a week, yep, guaranteed. One thing I'm very grateful for that will now be very offensive, I am still recognizable. <laughs> I think I've lost about a half an inch. <laughs> I think some of the audience are hoping that they don't lose any more inches. But uh, I think from the time I was hired, maybe I've gained 10 pounds. And uh, you know, I can, I can still wear the same clothes that I was wearing when I, I came here. And, uh, you know, suits are hard to wear out. <laughs> and, uh, I actually had, uh, you know, one student come to me and say that she was attending a nerd part, nerd's party in her ward and was wondering if she could go through my closet. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, the fact I'm recognizable may or may not be good. <laughs> okay. I held a really strong stance. And I, I didn't hold the stance when I taught psychology or money or anything else. But my stance was, uh, if I'm going to teach religion, I need to dress up for Joseph, and I need to dress up for Christ. And so far, I've worn a, a dress every day to work. A dress, something skirt, something that says, so if they call me on a mission, I got my wardrobe set. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I actually feel like uh, the men that I work with, they, they basically wear suits. And uh, it's my responsibility to uh, let the students know I, I dress up for them. I think they're great. And I, I want them to know that, hey, I dress up for Joseph. And if they don't think I look very good a day, you know, it's, I just means I should have been better. Okay, I, I have not posted in my career. And you realize I could have stopped posting uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, 100 books ago, I guess. <laughs> I have five books that are coming out in 2013. Will I be here? I have no idea. But all I know is I didn't post. Uh, I am still a nationally ranked ping pong player. <laughs> I try to play uh, Thursday nights. Uh, who's the one person I know that could beat me? Always my son, John. You know, you got to always play somebody better. And uh, that's been very fun. Okay, mistakes I made. And, uh, you know, the list could be huge on this. <laughs> One of the mistakes I've uh, strongly made has to do with parking. Uh, the parking issue 
why those ticket givers, citation, whatever, cannot recognize my Honda Civic is a motorcycle is beyond me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, partly, I, I know that I've given back to BYU in ways that I had not hoped I would do. So, I am willing to help students, I'm willing to fund scholarships, whatever it is, but, uh, but those parking citations, I'm getting to have quite a record. <laughs> Uh, another mistake I made, and this has to do especially in religion, I've been too quick to be offended. And, uh, you know, I, I fear that I've come home and shared that message. And, uh, you know, obviously it will have an effect, effect on your family. And, uh, you know, I, I actually think that some colleagues are just clueless. <laughs> you know? And uh, I, I think I was, you know, wearing the female thing on my shoulder. So, uh, you know, I, I wish that I had, um, that, that I had paused without uh, judging another. And, uh, you know, hopefully, faculty out there, you'll, you'll say, yeah, you know, if I'd been walking in their shoes, it might have been different. I want to speak about leadership. I actually think I'm a pretty good leader. I've been uh, president of Phi Kappa Phi and an associate dean in honors and, uh, I was president of the faculty women, all two of us got together. <laughs> Rock, scissors, and I won, you know. <laughs> uh, but uh, in, in religion, I was finally asked in 2009 to chair a committee. Now, you think about that. And, uh, you know, I, I wondered about it. And, uh, you know, there's glass ceilings, and then there's concrete. And, uh, you know, I, I wondered, is it my personality? And I, I guess I probably concluded it was. But about, it took me, you know, almost more than 30 years in, in the job. It took me more than 30 years to just one day, I'm having to go to a meeting, and I began listening to myself talking to someone on, on the phone saying, no, I can't go there because I have to attend a faculty meeting. And suddenly I picked up, I have to attend. And then I go, I do not like this. And uh, then, uh, you know, I, I also concluded leadership while well, it took me a while to realize I do not like controversy. <laughs> okay. You know, controversy means someone has to win and someone has to lose. And uh, I, I'm not good at controversy. I, I can fold better than most. And I also realized uh, I would hate having to tell somebody you need to step up your game. You know, you need to to be better in what you're doing. And uh, it took me a while to realize that. And then I started thinking, well, what if I had been the one worried about who's spending too much uh, money because of so much Xeroxing? <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, that would be just horrible. I go, that's not me. I don't like to turn on the lights, turn off the lights. I don't want to be the last one there, the last one. I'll just give me a microphone, let me teach, I'm done. And, but, but it took me about 30 years of my career to figure it out. And uh, through that process, I, um, I wasn't always as nice to the leaders who were over me as I should have been. Okay. Another mistake I made, I, I failed to make a difference at meetings. I always sat on the back row, I had reserve seats. <laughs> and uh, you know, I didn't want to make a comment, because if you make a comment, the meeting will extend. <coughs> Right? And, uh, and uh, some of our leaders, I fear they have 50 minutes and want to take the whole time. And so, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I failed to contribute where I could have. I also failed to take an interest in younger colleagues. And, uh, you know, instead of mentoring them, I'm uh, sitting in my office and I'm, you know, typing away. I've got another book I'm all excited about. Well, could I have done it better? You bet. So the question is, did I make a difference? So my journey as a scholar, uh, there are scholars and there are scholars, and uh, it's kind of like the ocean. Uh, the waves roll in, and then they roll out. And, uh, you know, you wonder, did you make any difference? And for most of us, maybe not. So uh, I thought I'd do one example. See the men's ties? Last, uh, last semester, the dean concluded that he would like to go around, he would like to visit one class of all the faculty members. 
He came to my class, and then afterwards, each of us had an opportunity to eat lunch in his office. I ate lunch with him in his office. He had nice things to say about my class, and then he said, Susan, I have a gift for you. And I'm like, really? I go, wow, that's pretty nice. And he goes to his closet, and he brings out a box of ties. <laughs> okay, I can look at it two ways. One is, could the man not afford a scarf? <laughs> Or two, I could look at it as, oh my gosh, I've arrived, I am one of the brethren. I <laughs> <laughs> so, wanting to think better of the situation, how has my time been as a scholar? Well, I put up uh, Esther, and it's not just for me, it's for all of us. When you go into the workplace, you know, make a difference <clears throat> for such a time as this. My time at BYU is almost over. Obviously, I have mistakes I've made. I have things I've liked. <sighs> Best things that I've done. Ah, my children. Huh. So, uh, you know, although you say, wow, it's been a long career. Sure, it's been a long career. And I'm um, grateful for it. I'm grateful for my students. I'm grateful for my love of my subject. I'm grateful I didn't post. Could have done a lot of things better, but I'm very most grateful that I got to be a mom. Anyway, you're much loved uh, for all of you still teaching and going on. I hope you've learned something great for those of you who are students. I uh, hope you've learned that an honest day's work does get an honest day's work. Anyway, thank you, and I say this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 first um, went over to religious said that you may not be able to make the scholarly contribution you'd like to make, um, and yet you were able to be successful. Was that just because you pushed so hard, or was it not um, the environment that you thought it would be, or a combination of it? How were you able to overcome those? Well, um, okay, so how, how could I overcome it? If you were to say, did doors open, I'm a really hard worker, a little bit of a workaholic, and, you know, passed on a family. But, um, you know, I made some personal goals, such as I won't get in the car with a male colleague, I won't go to lunch with a male colleague, you know, and you'd say, well, those are pretty old-fashioned. So if you're not riding around and going to conferences, you know, and uh, anyway, or, you know, or other places, what are you going to do? And the answer is you're going to write. And uh, what, what happens when you write? It's like playing the piano. You know, you play the piano and you start out chopsticks. And, uh, you know, and then you keep playing and pretty soon you're pretty good. And uh, some people think because they wrote in high school, they can still write. And I say, no, no, you have to do it every day. And pretty soon you're writing. It's like a symphony. It just comes so quick. Uh, most of my writing now, I can just talk it and the secretary types and I go back and I work. So, so, uh, I would say sheer determination, and uh, I typically don't give up. Okay, uh, my dad also had another slogan, I can't, I will, I must. Yeah? <laughs> I got it. <laughs> 
So I'm a high school teacher, and I'm just thinking. Great friend of mine. And, and a good friend. I like her a lot. I took her classes. Um, so my question is, how do you motivate your students who aren't necessarily, who maybe are a little mediocre in their work ethic, but they really have great potential? Well, you know, I, I have a different situation. I don't because no one majors in religion. I may just see them one semester. And so I, I don't get this kind of long following through to, you know, bachelor's and then graduate degree. So I'm, I'm a kind of in and out. So I, I don't know how actually motivated they are unless they do well on the test. So um, I don't know. I, I think example is overrated, actually. <laughs> and uh, so I don't know if my being uh, productive and moving on it has made any difference. I guess it's not, not something that I get to follow through and see how well we do. I'm, I'm uh, especially grateful, I guess, when I go out and, you know, like I said, fireside queen, happy birthday. If I haven't spoken in your word or say, you know, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm grateful when I, I see that they're still there and they're happy. <laughs> Could I intervene? How many of you are students of Susan Easton Blacks? Um, could I turn the question to you that was just asked? What does Dr. Black do that motivates you? Would you, and that, and that helps you? Um, that's something that I really appreciate about uh, Professor Black's teaching style. She's so, so passionate about what she teaches and um, I mean, I was excited about taking the class going into it, but even if I hadn't been, I, I, I don't think I could have helped just getting caught up in, uh, in, in the topics that she covers. I, I love it myself so much more because of the passion that she teaches with, so thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> I'm, yeah, I was gonna say I'd have roller skates or something, so I can. Is there room for another book about Joseph Smith and what new dimension could be highlighted? Okay, so the question is, is there another book, uh, you know, room for another book about Joseph? You know, oh, I hope so. I mean, there's so much still to be written. And, uh, well, you know, I'm always on something. But uh, one I'd like to do before life is over, I'd like to do the last 20 days of his life and to do the build-up for you to say, here are the bad guys, here's the good guys, and then finally it ends with the Lord my God. So that's, uh, that's what I'm working on. Let's see how it goes. How many women are now faculty in the religion department? Will you repeat the question? Okay, how many women are now uh, faculty members? Uh, we have, I don't know, maybe 73 total, and there are now five women. And uh, I, I was the lone woman, well, in church history, I was the lone woman from, uh, until 1995. Mm -hmm. And so for over 20 years. That shows you how good I did. <laughs> <laughs> so have I, have I made a path for other women? I, I don't know about that. But I, I do know that I made a path for other scholars. And, uh, you know, you, you got to earn the position. You know, the, the love of students, love of scholarship. And, uh, anyway. So, but I, I hope I've laid awake, you know, so that other women will, will also be there. Other questions? Describe the books you're working on. Okay, well, okay, so uh, describe the books I'm working on. So um, one that's being turned in in December is a hopefully definitive work, and I'm doing it with Larry Porter, you know, the man that would stand up every time I walk in. I love this guy. 
<laughs> okay, and uh, it's a biography on Martin Harris. And uh, it should be good, and it's coming out in BYU Studies. I'm doing, uh, and uh, so it goes in in December. One that's uh, coming out, well, two are in newspapers. And uh, we digitize, I sent to Bangladesh and digitize old LDS newspapers. One's called uh, The Nauvoo Neighbor, and uh, the other, another one's called The Prophet, and it was printed in uh, Boston, kind of Philadelphia, also New York. And uh, both of those newspapers tell us a lot more about Joseph Smith running for president. So those two books are coming out. I'm then doing one with uh, Mary Jean Woodger and uh, Lloyd Newell on uh, 100 Famous LDS uh, Men. And then I'm doing one with a student, Hal Boyd, on uh, poetry from uh, the early days of the church. And uh, all of those will be out in 2013. And oh, I'm also doing one. Uh, 400 question answers on the Old Testament. And uh, that one's bringing me to my knees. There are 39 books in the Old Testament, and uh, wow, everybody's written about the Old Testament. And so, uh, you know, I'm just boom, 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 reading these books this summer. I read 37 books this summer on the Old Testament, and, uh, you know, one of the books was the dish dictionary to the words of the Old Testament. So, you know, I'm I, I'm uh, struggling with that one, but it's supposed to be out by an exception. Do you ever sleep? <laughs> Not well. <laughs>